And uh, we'll start with uh, the Six Perfections prayer that we've been using. And uh, for those of you in person, it's on page 91 of Lama Chippa. So on page 91, the prayer will start. And for those of you on Zoom, I'll just do share screen, so no worries. So if you wanna just take a minute and settle into your posture, really connect with your space. That one. All right. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity through the guideline teaching for enhancing the mind that gives without attachment, namely transforming our bodies, wealth, and collection of virtues over the three times into the objects desired by each and every sentient being. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of moral discipline working for the sake of sentient beings enacting virtuous deeds and not transgressing the bounds of the Pratamoksha, Bodhisattva and tantric vows, even at the cost of our lives. Should even the myriad beings of the three realms without exception become angry at us, humiliate, criticize, threaten or even kill us, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of patience not to be distraught but to work for their benefit in response to their harm. Even if we must remain for an ocean of eons in the fiery hells of Avicii for the sake of one sentient being alone, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of joyous effort, to strive with compassion for supreme enlightenment and not to be discouraged. Having abandoned the faults of dullness, agitation and mental wandering, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of meditative concentration through the samadhi of single pointed placement upon the nature of reality, which is that all things are void of true existence. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of wisdom through the space-like yoga of single-minded placement upon ultimate truth, conjoined with the ecstasy and great bliss induced by the discriminating wisdom analyzing suchness. We seek your blessings to perfect samadhi on illusion by realizing how all external phenomena like true existence yet still appear, like a mirage, a dream, or the image of the moon on a still lake. Samsara and nirvana lack even an atom of true existence, while cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagarjuna's thought which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. And so just sitting with your motivation to engage with these six perfections, generosity, ethics, patience, joyous effort, concentration, wisdom, and to request for blessings is mainly to request our own mind to be open to transformation, to be receptive to wisdom, both inner and outer, and for all of this mental energy to lead to the fulfillment of our fullest potential for the enlightenment of all sentient beings. Okay. So it's nice to see you all and thanks for coming back. Today we'll be looking mostly at generosity. And if you've missed a class or you're jumping in and out, it's gonna be clear, I think, as time goes by. These concepts are not intellectually hard, they're experientially hard. They're concepts that you already were on board with before you were Buddhist, but now we're upgrading them so that the motivation is something that is actually going to build momentum towards enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. So a lot of the questions we ask ourselves are, what stands in opposition to living by our ideals? 
What is it that blocks our heart? Or what is it that ruins momentum or stifles the open heart? What are the things that prevent us from living in this way? And I think that if you can kind of unpack what it is that the self-cherishing thought, for example, says you can't do, otherwise you'll miss out, or you can't do, otherwise you'll suffer, then the lack of logic will become clearer. But before we examine self-cherishing, it really feels like it's helping you and it feels like it's necessary. And if you don't have it, no one is gonna look after you. And self-cherishing, the direct antidote is bodhicitta. And so if we want to get over our self-cherishing, we need to see the way in which it says it's our protector, but it actually lies. So it says you have to look out for yourself first and only with indifference to others or even at the expense of others. And it's the me first pushing, driving, striving, ambitious energy that says, get out of my way, otherwise I'll be trampled. And there's an element of it, which is just good self-preservation, which is being assertive, which is getting your basic needs met, which we should keep, which is really important to have. But the negative self-cherishing is the one that makes us oblivious to the impact of our actions on others. So we might not even be intentionally wishing to harm at all. It's just this kind of ripple effect of our obliviousness or of our carelessness or our distraction that we kind of give ourselves permission to have because we're just looking out for ourselves, not causing any trouble, not wanting to hurt people. But by not thinking of them, we wind up doing that and alienating people and this whole ripple effect of disharmony happens all around us. So when we're working on developing bodhicitta, we're being proactive in engaging with things like these six perfections in order to confront this whole wave of beginningless time habit of self-cherishing. Because all of these ideals stand in direct opposition to the self-cherishing thought. So when you hear this word self-cherishing, this is the one to blame for everything. The self-cherishing thought is the one to blame for everything. It comes from self-grasping ignorance, but kind of the, the play or the display of self-grasping ignorance is our everyday life's behavior of self-cherishing. And it's why we feel isolated and alone or alienated. It's why we feel like people don't understand us or support us. It's the one that is so thoroughly self-referent that you start to feel all alone. So, you know, there's ways in which we speak about um, things like depression, which are really unhelpful and unhealthy and unkind, but have elements of truth. And we could say that depression is a symptom of really extreme self-cherishing. But this is not something to say to someone in the middle of their depression. Okay. But the, you know, when people say to a depressed person, oh, you're just thinking about yourself. You're only thinking of yourself. You're making everything a big deal because it's all about you. And that is completely unkind and unhelpful and not the whole story of depression or acknowledging genetic influences or trauma issues or chemical things within the brain. It's not looking at the big picture of depression, but there is an element of truth there, which is that even if you hate yourself, that self is at the center of the universe. And that is not where the self is located, <laughs> right? Because the universe doesn't really have a center and it's certainly not one little individual. So it's kind of like we become so obsessed with trying to take care of this one individual that we forget about the way in which this one individual will be held and looked after via connection. And so the nicest thing to do for yourself if you're depressed or in a real self-cherishing kind of echo chamber is to think of what can I do for others? But if someone says that to you when you're in the middle of some heavy space, you're just gonna be annoyed. You know, they'll be like, you think of other people. You know, like I'm too heavy, too sad, too, you know, dark to think of other people. I can barely look after myself and, you know, wash my hair or whatever. But if you yourself, have that wisdom, you can tell yourself, when I am in this heavy, dark space, 
the best thing I can do is to just kind of like take care of basic needs and then think of what I can do for other people. Because the immediate relief of the heaviness of heart will come from connection. And part of the darkness is feeling disconnected. So what can you do to benefit others is gonna be the quickest way out of your dark space. So the first kind of one that we'll look at is this generosity idea, which it can sound cliche and it can sound simplistic, but make sure you're hearing it from the deepest place. So just to review a paramita or a perfection means to go beyond, right? Reaching for perfection, not to be a perfectionist, not to think that being perfect is within your ability this second. It's more of an ideal and an aspiration to make you excited about. So all of these perfections are done with a bodhicitta motivation. And they take us beyond samsara to Buddhahood, where all obscurations have been eliminated and all good qualities have been developed limitlessly. So these perfections become super mundane when conjoined with the wisdom realizing emptiness. Here the bodhisattva knows that the agent, object and action of each perfection arise dependently and are therefore empty of inherent existence. We lost you. So generosity in brief is the intention to give, right? The intention to give, it's not actually the giving. And this is important, okay? So put a pin in that, we'll come back to it. Ethics is restraint from harm, right? So restraint from harm is not implying that, you know, you're being a good kid or you're doing something, you know, to be ethical or it's really just very clean restraint from harm. And that means harming oneself and harming others. Patience is forbearance with suffering. Joyous effort is enthusiasm for beneficial actions. Concentration is abiding with a beneficial object and wisdom is realization of ultimate reality. Okay, so when you see these six perfections, kind of understand the essence of what these words mean because while they are similar to how we use them colloquially, there are some nuances that are very specific to Buddhism. So here's the nature of them. And I think we'll come back to that slide. For now, let's just look at generosity. So Lama, uh, Lama Tsongkhapa would say, it is the virtue of a generous attitude and the physical and verbal actions which are motivated by this. Thus the practice of the perfection of generosity entails generating in various ways the intention to give and steadily increasing this generosity even though you may not be actually giving away something to others. So there's four types, right? There's the obvious giving of property or material support. Then there's giving Dharma, meaning timely advice when asked. There's giving refuge or freedom from fear. And then there's active love or Maitri. So you can see how those basic ideals go right up against the self-cherishing thought that says me first, me first. And they can sound kind of simplistic and being goody two shoes, but if you're thinking about something like, how, what is it like in your mind to be ready to give? Like generosity of spirit. So say you don't have anything to give, you don't have any resources in particular, or you do, but you don't have a plan for them yet. But your mentality is, I am ready to give. And you can just like picture a day when you're in that mood of what can I offer to others, whether materially, whether in terms of energy, whether it's in terms of just creating safe space or having love itself. When you're in that mood, do you feel stifled in your cave of self-cherishing, sad and alone? Or do you feel kind of open and expansive and in a way flexible and relaxed? Yeah, can you picture yourself on a like a generous day and the way you kind of feel an active readiness? Yeah, and this isn't like those days when you're like putting out fires or trying to fix things in a kind of neurotic attached way. It's when you're just kind of deeply open. The first benefit of that attitude is to oneself as the individual. Before anyone is even at the receiving end of it, there's relief in your mind because it's no longer all about you. 
there's also relief in your mind because you feel empowered. You know that you do have things to offer. Even if it's only offering something like safe space, you realize only, that's not only, that's everything. What is it to enter into a group of people and for them to know immediately you're not going to judge them, that you're not going to be harshly critical of them, that you're going to warmly embrace their presence and not kind of get clickish or turn away from them. Like how amazing is that to offer that to people? That's generosity. Offering loving kindness, you know, wanting them to have happiness. And that's open-ended, not thinking that it's your job to then inject them with happiness or to fix their unhappiness. It's just the open-hearted attitude that wants that for them and is happy when you see it enacted. Can you feel the vibe of that? And offering Dharma is a weird one because we don't proselytize. We are not missionaries, nor should we ever be, you know, and we know that's incredibly problematic when other religions feel that need, that they're probably coming from a good place. They probably want to help soothe suffering and bring happiness and <laughs> dot, 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 see history for details. It doesn't always go well often not. So in offering Dharma, we're not saying proselytize, we're saying listen deeply for receptivity. There are moments in time when people are open to your wisdom and moments in time when they are absolutely not open to it. So if you're listening for this person could actually use my skill set, I'm right in there to offer it. And if they're not, I'm not going to push it. It's not healthy. It's not going to go in. But I can offer Dharma in a million different ways as soon as I feel that opening and that receptivity from people who are saying, I want to hear more ideas. Do you know what I mean? So Dharma doesn't have to be Buddha Dharma. It's anything that is going to lead to relief of suffering or increase of happiness in the you know, deep cosmic spiritual sense, as opposed to the symptoms relief kind of putting a Band-Aid on it sense, though it can include that sometimes too. And then material things, it's, you know, obviously we want to be charitable to those who are in need. Obviously, we don't want to be miserly and clinging and hoarding and having some sort of deprivation mentality. Of course, we want to have that abundant giving attitude. But, excuse me, from a Buddhist perspective, the giving of material resources is kind of the most coarse. And these other forms are more subtle or higher in a way. So it's kind of like, if you don't know what else to do, feed people, right? Or if you don't know what else to do, give them a blanket. Or, you know, like if you can't do anything else, help with resources and basic needs. But really these higher things are more important because they're more long-term. They're not more important in terms of everyone needs their basic needs met, of course they do. But you know what I mean? They're higher in the sense of what's gonna deeply help people feel empowered to get themselves out of suffering themselves. So how is this conversation landing so far when you're thinking about generosity? Are you having ideas or triggers or anything about um, self-cherishing that you're curious about? Christina? I always feel bad asking questions because I'm like, <laughs> but my quick question is, um, so in the, in the discovery of this whole, uh, idea, right. Of, of, of being generous, like I thought, wow, well, I, I love being generous. I, it makes me feel good. Right. And in that contemplation, I realized, wait a second, that's very selfish. <laughs> right. So it was like, I came to this realization that, oh, I, I love doing things for other people. I love serving others. I love being there for others but it's also because I feel good. And so there was like this selfish motivation that was coming out of it. And, um, and so, so it's like, are, am I to work towards this idea that I can do those same actions without any sort of, um, maybe it's a, a subtle level of attachment or something like that. So maybe you can speak on that. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point. And I think that it comes to this slightly cringy absolutely necessary self-awareness that we need to have that at our level, there are very few things we will do for others that aren't also in our own best interest. 
you know? And so it's almost like you're having radical self-honesty and radical self-acceptance that says, absolutely the good I do in this world, there is something in it for me, even if the only thing in it for me is feeling happy about it, <laughs> you know, right? And, and the, like eventually, or on a good day, you are doing something completely with an open heart with no need to feel good about it, no need for it to be effective. You just know it's important. And so you do it with an open heart. And even at our level right now, there are days when we do it completely from an open heart and we really don't care if we have like the warm fuzzies about it. You know, there are good days, right? There are days when we're like on track with it, but then what happens is often we are happy having done it. Why? Because doing positive actions waters the seeds of our past positive karma. So we're having old karma ripen as happiness under the conditions of this present moment. So it's almost like you can't avoid enjoying it, even if you wanted to. So great, <laughs> yay. Um, but I think if you go into it with an expectation of, I need to do this because of warm fuzzies, that's gonna backfire. But I think we already know that. It's just kind of like this acknowledgement of, we can't be superficial good people anymore. We have to be deep in our work for becoming quote, a good person. And the deep work means, going into things like saying, it's not that I don't have judgments, it's that I'm managing my judgments. It's not that I don't criticize, it's that I'm adjusting the way in which I criticize so it's more broad and more compassionate. You know, rather than saying, oh, I don't judge anyone, we do, <laughs> you know? And so knowing that, then you can manage and navigate it and make it more altruistic, make it more wisdom-based, make it more kind. But if you were to say something to yourself like, oh, I don't judge anyone, or I do this purely from the goodness of my heart, that's the only reason I do it is only to be good for others, and you don't ever acknowledge that there's something in it for you, that keeps it at that superficial level, you know? So I think the very fact that you know that there's warm fuzzies in it for you means that it's more likely for you to do it with a purer heart because you already know that pitfall. I think it's more dangerous if we're lying to ourselves and saying, I'm doing this only for the greater good. You know, you go, nothing for me. And we can get like weird and martyred or we can get kind of like pretentious or like all these things can happen. So if we know there is something in it for me, but that's not gonna be why I do it adjust, adjust, healthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, Teresa, and then Roxy. I have a question about when you're sensing people are not receptive. Sometimes I just feel awkward. I don't know what to do. I don't want to be rude. I don't want to be disrespectful, but I can tell they're not receptive. So I just wonder if you can speak about that, what to do. Yeah, yeah, what to do when people don't feel receptive. I think that if people aren't feeling receptive to your generosity or you can tell that they're not, actually the practice can be, how about I don't impose, you know, actually not even impose energetically. And this is so tricky because we just wanna help. We wanna be a kind person and we just wanna help. But even goodwill itself can feel invasive to someone who doesn't have any space to receive it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I, try, I think about this with some family members that I have who kind of impose gift giving, <laughs> you know, they're like, here's something for you that I will never use and I do not need. I can accept it for the sake of their generosity practice, even if it's not something I want. But if someone comes up to me in a shopping mall and says, I'll pray for you, which happens relatively regularly for me, um, <laughs> I appreciate the sentiment, but I'm also a little creeped out. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, it's sort of like, great, I, I'm glad you're praying for me, but I think there's something icky about that. Like there's an imposition that's like goodwill mixed with something, mixed with something that I'm not open to and I have not asked for and do not need. And it's like, ugh. So we, we ourselves, I think have to be careful that even though generally speaking, our heart's in the right place, if people aren't feeling openness, even goodwill feels invasive. And so it's kind of like, okay, let's just pull the energy back. Like, you know, just kind of pull it back, give them space and watch, you know, 
if they need me, I'm here. If they're not, if they don't need me, that's fine. It's not like anyone's going to be lost to time and space. No one's going to be lost till the end of time. Like, you know, if even Hitler can become enlightened eventually, then this person in front of me who doesn't want my cookies, they'll be fine, you know? <laughs> Right. So I think sometimes our attachment gets this illusion of urgency that is like, I must help them now because I want to be a good bodhisattva. And if they can't be helped, that's just adding more pressure to their already stressful vibe. Yeah. That's one thought. But yeah, yeah, Roxy, go ahead. Well, maybe just answer my question because I was going to just narrow the frame to um, parents of teenagers who are suffering. Um, so I'll just say I'm one of those who really wants to relieve the suffering of, of my um, child. And I think that that what you said feels very wise that sometimes withdrawing energy might be the appropriate thing to do to give space. Um, but if it's not a stranger, it's someone you're very invested in. I can see that that would be sort of self-cherishing because I'm in pain because she's in pain. Oh. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, teenagehood is, is culturally about self-cherishing. So it's <laughs> quite a lot to say from a dharmic point of view about <clears throat> maybe some wise little things to do to get beyond that. But it's difficult when um, you really want to be yourself wants to be approved of by an entire culture. So without going on and on, if you have any little tidbits about that specific subculture. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I mean, uh, I, I don't have kids myself, but I was certainly a snotty teenager. Um, so I, I'm an expert in snotty teenagers being disillusioned and grumpy and full of angst. So um, I feel like I, achieved, I leveled up to that. I really achieved that angsty teenager state quite well. And I would like to take this moment to apologize to my parents. Um, but you know, there were a lot of piercings, there were a lot of tattoos and um, you know, like that. I think that one thing that we can think and this is like basic, and I know you already know this, but can we train in not taking anything personally, even when it's personal? Even when it's personal, you know? Don't take anything personally, because even if it's directed towards you, it's never always about you, right? We are only ever a condition. We are never a cause. We are a condition for people's pain. We are a condition for people's happiness, but we are never the cause of their pain or the cause of their happiness. So, you know, when I have youth groups, for example, if something's not working for an individual, I really try to be as honest as I can and say, I can see that the way I'm communicating is not working for you right now. I just want to say, you know, I'm, I'm here, we can talk about it, but I'm going to give you some space and even name, I'm going to give you space right now. And I'm totally here if you change your mind and you're allowed to change your mind and you're allowed to criticize all of those things, you know? But that mentality of how about I just take nothing personally? Yeah, and if I am like not successful in helping my child, that means there weren't enough conditions coming together for, the con for it to be effective. It's not a personal failing, you know? It's just things didn't come together. They might have just needed, you know, their their best friend to say, oh my gosh, your hair looks great today. And then they're like magically happy from their deep existential angst. All they needed was like peer validation, right? right? And you thought there's some like deep impending dread and they're having body dysmorphia and they're having a whole thing. And really they just needed someone to say their hair looks great, you know? Right, <laughs> right. right, yeah. Um, Allie, do you wanna go? Hi, Venerable Johnson. Um, so I wanted to ask, uh, so what's that, there have been like situations where I have practiced generosity and then the person I practiced generosity to was like a friend or someone close and they, they, they would go and eventually do something that's not very nice, like say something terrible behind my back or something like that. So I wanted to ask like when, how do we not fall in, is, or do you have any suggestions about how do we not fall into that like trap of attachment and like from like oh I practice generosity then it becomes attachment and then it kind of becomes anger like repressed anger like how do we like kind of like avoid that yeah I mean if you were to just intuitively guess what would you say because I feel like you're 90 percent there 
I would feel like guess? I would I feel like I would say that more compassion yeah more compassion is always going to come in handy um compassion for you compassion for them I think together with that is just as we acknowledge that there is usually something in it for us when we are kind when we are generous Uh. even if it's just warm fuzzies there's also something in it for them when they're being kind to us when they're being generous towards us there's something in it for them and unless we are consciously trying to be motivated better and habitually doing that we all objectify each other constantly we are all objects to one another to give or take happiness and that is very basic and very animal and very embarrassing and kind of like poignant because don't we want to be bigger and better than that don't we want to be working for the greater good and all of these things when in fact we're saying are you going to give me happiness or not oh if you are then i'll be nice (laughs) are you going to give me happiness or not oh no okay well not today then sorry no no time for you and we are all very self-centered selfish creatures and to know that means you can manage that and expand past it and it also means you forgive others more easily when you see it in them because instead of seeing them as being unkind or not thoughtful or not seeing you you see them as humanity right just another reflection of humanity or a reflection in the mirror of i know what it is to objectify people and i feel them objectifying me and i don't like how it feels May I never do this to others. So that very disregard that they are doing to you, you take as ammunition for your path to say, this feels awful to be seen in that light. May I never do this to others. May I never do this to others. But you're also giving yourself some detachment and space that is not so hooked into needing them. Yeah, we need humans, but we don't need specific ones. Right, right, and this is kind of what attachment says to us. Attachment says you need this particular set of humans for your happiness, like these five people. You need to have them active and close and in constant validation of you. When in fact, you just need humanity in general because we're all interdependent. But you could make a good close friend randomly at a coffee shop this moment if you wanted to. Right, we have good social skills. We could just like, you know, be brave, make a friend. It's just, we're used to what this like five or 10 that we have all around all the time. So then we think those are the ones and the only ones that can give us what we need. So if you can get some space in there, it kind of loosens the pressure. So there's that piece too. But how does that all land? Do you feel any resistance or ideas? Um, I th- I feel like that was a very wonderful and true and on point explanation and uh, very helpful. Uh, So thank you so much. I'll really think about it. And uh, it's true. Like we don't need like specific humans. We can always like, if we're willing to open our hearts, we can always make more connection. Yeah. I, and I, I say this a lot, those of you that know me, you know, I use this analogy a lot, but really think of how you are when you travel. Yeah, when you travel, you're in the mood to make friends. You're in the mood to enjoy something. You are ready to take pleasure in the unexpected. You know, you can even find graffiti or a dump heap artistic and take pictures of it at intriguing (laughs) angles, right? Suddenly it's all glorious when you're in that mode. And if we're just forever in, I am a traveler, even if I've lived in the same town for 20 years, if you're in that mode, there is more engagement and enjoyment of everything, you know, and it's like life's rich pageant, you know. Yeah, yeah Camille, did you want to add something? You know, I think actually you answered uh, it. It was a slightly different question. And if you have any any other spin on it, um, please add it. It, it, it was related in you know, at times when I feel that, that generosity coming up, I'm aware that it's almost as a protection of, please don't let me end up like that. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm giving, but it's with, and, and it comes from a genuine place, but I'm also aware at the same time that there is this sense of, of pity, almost to an extent of fear. Mm-hmm. And I just, and, and I think the things you were just talking about 
relate to what I was going to ask, giving that extra space, giving yourself a little forgiveness that you're, the generosity is still there, but remaining aware of that as a, as something that's coming up. But do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, um, with which, which bit do you feel like needs a bit more elaboration? Which piece do you think? I think the part of, um, it's, it's a lot to unpack from a small thing, but when you come across somebody who is in a very, very dark place, um, you, yeah. you think they might be using and really in trouble. It especially hits me with younger people yeah. because part of me wants to just dive in and say, why are you here? What can I do? Why do you not have help? And I want to help and I feel stuck in, you know, giving whatever it is that I am in the moment. It might just be a smile and a genuine like, how are you? Are you okay? But I also feel this wave of, um, you know, pity and fear for them, fear for our future. So how do I keep the genuine, um, you know, the generosity clear of pity and how do I keep it gold? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great way of asking. I think there's something very important about self-awareness of how you are when you're in an afflicted state that creates pathways of empathy and creates affinity and helps you keep people in absolute respect, even when they're doing seemingly foolish things or things that would be foolish if you did them given your education and your context. And it's easy to kind of look down on them. If you have your own self-awareness really active even and especially when you're in the dark place, right? When, you, when, you're, when you know you're doing the wrong thing, watch yourself do it rather than feel change, change, change and all this pressure, watch yourself do it. Like, you know, the next time you eat the wrong food or the next time you choose not to do the exercise thing or the next time you want to avoid your meditation cushion or avoid conflict with a coworker or avoid, avoid, or, you know, go to battle unnecessarily, blah, 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 right? So the next time you're in your affliction, which you can tell you're in your affliction if the mind is agitated, right? If the mind is agitated, you're going to down the wrong road. So if you can watch yourself and kind of notice the lies you tell yourself and the justifications and the excuses and all of the ways in which we block our own understanding of reality, then it's almost like your own absurdity and knowing your own absurdity makes it impossible for you to judge other people. You know, like, so say someone's doing something really foolish with their finances, that you would never do that specific thing. But you can think about some time when you were younger or less educated about finances and you made some silly choice and how much it made sense to you at the time, but you would never do it now. And you do those kind of reflections and realize how much everything is contextual. And our judgment usually comes from assuming that knowledge is self-evident, when in fact it's only self-evident to us because of our history. And then we're like putting that on people and thinking they should know everything that we know, you know? So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that self-awareness prevents being patronizing and condescending if it's real. Self-awareness, if it's got a lot of shame and a lot of judgment and a lot of heaviness from whatever your, you know, I don't know, family of origin issues or former religions or whatever it was, if it has a lot of guilt and shame, then it'll carry defensiveness and that will block this whole thing. So know, know that this is not an invitation to shame. This is an invitation to understanding the universal human experience. So the details are going to differ. But the fact of we all are foolish and do things from afflictions is gonna be true. Yeah. So that deep self-knowledge means that when you meet someone who is suffering and you're not able to quote, fix it, there's a lot more spaciousness to just kind of hold them with compassion, which implies respect. Because pity is looking down, compassion is looking up. You're seeing their potential to be enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings at the same time as they're suffering. Empathy is just seeing their suffering 
what you do with that knowledge and what you do with that information, you could do any number of things with it. Empathy is just kind of looking mm -hmm. straight, you know, eye to eye. Pity is looking down, compassion is looking up. So the behaviors might be the same, whether it's pity, empathy, or compassion. Yeah, the behaviors might be like, would you like a cup of tea in a chat? <laughs> but if the vibe is, I have absolute belief that you are not your suffering, even though you are suffering. I have absolute belief that this is temporary and that we are all working towards development of our fullest potential. And this moment will pass. And if I'm not the condition to help you, that is not your fault or my fault. It's just not enough conditions are in place. So like that detachment frees up space, frees up that kind of like illusion of urgency. And then you can even have the space to ask yourself, what is the worst case scenario? And see if you can make peace with that, which is why for a Buddhist, understanding past and future lives can give you a lot more space because if it all goes to hell right now, well, it's not the end of the story, right? They'll get another chance, we'll all get another chance. You know, nothing is ever truly lost. Yeah, that mental continuum can just kind of pick up in a new body, keep going, but I think anyone who's ever worked with someone with an addiction or ourselves have had addictions to realize that blocking people touching the rock bottom kind of delays the process as well. So sometimes the kindest thing is to let people play it out. And that is the worst and hardest thing to have to watch because we do not want our loved ones to suffer. But sometimes if they can go to the end of here's what the consequence of these actions are, then there's the openness on the other side to receive wisdom and to hear their own wisdom. Yeah, but it's like to hear wisdom, it has to be worth our while. And if we're kind of still a little bit okay, we might not have ears to hear new information because we're thinking, yes, I am suffering a little, but not that bad. I mean, I still have cake and everything, so it's fine, right? <laughs> right, so rock bottom is, a hard thing to watch people hit and it's a hard thing for us to hit in terms of samsara rock bottom you know how do we break our addiction to samsara we have to let ourselves see and become disillusioned by the fact that all of our relationships are tainted by attachment them objectifying us us objectifying them all of us just hurting each other sometimes intentionally sometimes unintentionally and that that is an unacceptable thing that we don't wanna be a part of anymore. We want to be out and free of that negative habitual pattern. We want to be an agent of actual kindness. Yeah, and so in order to do that, sometimes some distance is necessary, some space, some, you know, just kind of give it a minute. Yeah. It always feels like a paradox, doesn't it? To think I want to become enlightened for the welfare of all sentient beings. So I'm kind of kind of ignore what sentient beings are up to right now because they'll just keep running around in circles, hurting themselves like they have been. And so will I. I'm just gonna like let that play out for a minute and like work on my own heart so that when I enter back into the fray, I'm actually useful and not like adding to the chaos. Yeah, so I'm working for all sentient things by retreating to my cave because I'm not going to stay in my cave forever. I'm going to come back out a clearer and more useful tool. Yeah. So having a simpler life can help too. A little bit less busy, a little bit less movement, more time to reflect and really notice the way our afflictions play out. Are there other thoughts, questions? And it's totally fine to debate too. If this isn't sitting well, please ask. Okay, we'll let it brew. I, I'm gonna, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have a picture because I'm losing my computer. Uh, so <laughs> here we go. Um, yes, initially when, when I heard what you were saying, um, about the um, uh, generosity, um, and I can't exactly remember the, the exact words, but it didn't hit me right. It was like, now, wait a minute, I've been working on uh, self-love 
mm. <laughs> rather than self-hate for such a long time that um, this, no, no, you can't say that. <laughs> um, so it's one, uh, an attachment to words or it's an understanding of words. I appreciate that. Uh, and making the words I hear you saying my own in ways that make sense to me in a healthy way. Uh, so I really, this is, yes, this is the best thing that could happen to me today. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, yes, and thanks for everyone who has, you know, made comments. It's just so helpful to hear people talking and sharing what this means to me or in working with it. So it's just, yes, you know, and, and, and in terms of this generosity, um, it's hitting at a perfect time or the best time in my life. I don't have all the words to say how that is. It just is because I'm going back and forth a lot around who I have been throughout my life that I am no longer now. And I'm kind of tired of being reborn, okay? Good. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> May I please have a little stability here? So, uh, yeah. so thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, you know, yay Dharma. Um, I think it's it's just really comes back to this sympathy for oneself that realizes that our strategies prior to meeting to the Dharma or prior to thinking about these things, they made sense. Our strategies made sense, but they were short term and they had a limited benefit. And to say, I'm going to immediately from this point onward, only have the big picture, only have the long view. That's too much of a stretch for us right away. We need to build into it. But if we can mm -hmm. start aspirationally that thinks, how about I stop with the symptoms relief? I can make samsara a little bit more bearable for myself, but that's really just adding some throw cushions to my prison cell. So it's a little better, but it's not getting out. Yeah. And the way in which to get out is going to take some pretty intense self-reflection on what on earth is the self, where on earth did these habits come from, and how can I actively confront them? And then we'll go, oh my gosh, but it's like leaving the only home I've ever known. I don't want to live in prison, but it's the only home I've ever had. Eek, you know, I've become indoctrinated into the system. Oh no. So just like that gentle starting to look outside, starting to look out the window through your little bars and go, it is a bit more big and beautiful and spacious out there. And I'm a little intimidated and scared by that. Let's just be gentle. Yeah, really gentle. And that self-love and self-compassion on one hand is to stop doing the behaviors that hurt yourself and others. And on the other hand is to actively cultivate the tools for long-term happiness as opposed to short-term symptoms relief. So, you know, it takes a deep dive, a lot, of, a lot of deep thought. And I think that there's so much to stimulate us right now that there needs to be active choice to not be stimulated. Yeah, we have to actively choose to sit quietly long enough to be bored. You know, we're like panicked if we get bored these days, but like sit long enough to be bored because a few steps after boredom is creativity. And then your creative mind can engage with the Dharma and play with it and see how the Dharma relates to you specifically as an individual in your life today. And then change actually starts to happen. But if you stay kind of continuously agitated or stimulated, then there's not a lot of room for the Dharma to take hold and fundamentally change behaviors and mentalities. It just stays as ideas you like, but can't quite practice. And then you feel bad about yourself, like you're stupid or incapable, when of course you're not. Everyone has Buddha nature. You've just never, you know, given yourself any room for it to take hold. Yeah. It's like trying to plant seeds in a tornado. You got to kind of let the tornado settle down before the seeds are going to stick. Yeah. So kind of unpacking this generosity a bit more and then we'll have a little stretch and then we'll do the meditation. 
so there are these types right and this is all in your course materials but this is just a summary just clarifying that material generosity or giving of property um, as Geshe Rapton says in his commentary to perfect the perfection we need a very strong desire to help others and a very strong will but if our motive for giving property is to gain fame, for instance, this is not the practice of giving at all. So here's this invitation to be like an anonymous donor. <laughs> you know, a lot of our generosity, when it's a big action of generosity, it can be performative. You know, we want to contribute to a cause, but we really want our name on that donor list and we want to be fancy and shiny and everyone to think, aren't they a generous person? Aren't they amazing and kind? And then, you know, people will kind of be around you in a kind and friendly way because they sort of want something from you and they want your contribution to their cause or their project and who is actually your friend. So it's not really great for you either, is it? But it's hard for us to give anonymously. It's really hard. And it's not saying that you have to, but it's really asking yourself, am I giving because of genuine deep care? Or am I giving because I want to be seen a certain way or both, right? And usually both, I'm guessing. But if we can kind of know that and then start to adjust and do an exercise of how is it that I can do this in a cleaner way, that can really make it more powerful. So giving material resources, we're giving with this idea that this is an energetic habit more than a physical fixing or physical gifting that's now going to have some kind of tangible effect it might or it might not the main practice is the energy you're creating in your mind so when you see things like these water bowls you know in dharma centers and you think why the water bowls i mean pretty but why one of the deepest practices is the practice of generosity is practice so if you're doing this every day, you're creating a mental pattern that says giving is important, giving is emphasized, then you're in your daily life, giving comes more spontaneously. You don't have to stop and think, oh, I should be generous. It's just kind of in the natural flow of your behaviors with people. So we're offering something like water because water is precious and water is deeply important. And it's not gonna trigger our, sense of deprivation because it's usually cheap enough for us to offer it freely without that tug of i won't have enough i won't have enough you know so you can offer it freely while still seeing it's valuable it's creating a new mental pathway isn't it and you're offering it to the buddha because you're respecting the buddha because you want to become like the buddha because you acknowledge this is your potential so it's not like here, please take this water or oh Buddha, I'm so bad and low, please bestow upon me all of your blessings and realizations because I am so bad and low. It's not like that. It's saying that's me when I grow up. Acknowledging that brings me closer to it. Acknowledging it makes me closer to it. Do, do you understand, right? So it's like the actual doing of it physically is not the main thing, it's the mentality. And that's what we want to bring to all of our actions of generosity. It's the mentality, the open heart. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions about that one? Yeah, Teresa. I think it's the same as Christina. I love giving gifts. It makes me so happy. Yeah. Like almost more than anything else. I love making things for people. I love buying things for people. I love giving things to people. And so when you say make sure your motive is clean, I don't know. Yeah. Make sure your motive is clean first by acknowledging that it isn't always <laughs> right. Right. And that, you know, I love to do this. I love to, you know, offer things to people. And if I have no expectations, it'll go better. <laughs> right. Because they might receive it and be like, eh, what's this? Or they might receive it and go, oh, what I always wanted. There's a million responses. But if in your mind, it's about creating a mental pathway of offering is the way I want to live. It frees up your heart. It frees up flexibility. It just keeps you more in connection with humanity. If they like it, that's a bonus, mm -hmm. you know, but it's no longer the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really tricky, these ones. 
Um, the other ones are so much more, I guess, obviously mental that there are fewer pitfalls of this area, but there still can be, right? So again, giving Dharma, Geshe says, the giving of Dharma means that one gives with pure mind the true teachings to other beings. This type of giving is more beneficial than giving of property. Possession of property helps for only a limited time while Dharma is lasting and more deeply helpful. So it is very much like that old saying, you know, give a man a fish, he eats for a day, teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime, that, you know, that cliche. It's a little bit along those lines of really what we want is to help people to help themselves and to empower people to know that Buddhahood is within their reach, within their mind streams potential, and that it's not for special people. You know, it's not for some sort of unique species of human that's like, you know, magical more than anyone else. It's just a matter of who is practiced and who hasn't, not who is good or who is bad, right? Because we're all a mixed bag and beginningless time. We've been everything to everyone. And, you know, we've been terrible dictators and we've been grand philanthropists and we've been sweet mothers and we've been abusive fathers and we've done all the things, all, you know, countless times, like forever. So, leave identity aside and just say, moving forward, I want to offer tools that are going to help myself and others actualize our potential. Yeah. And just kind of shift the whole conversation of who am I out of it? Because all of our choices made sense within their context. Yeah. So we take responsibility, not fault, all those sayings, right? Yeah. So offering Dharma, I always call this timely advice when asked. Yes, timely advice when asked. And this comes back to that self-awareness conversation of ask yourself, when have you heard advice and taken it on board? You as an individual, when have you actually heard someone else's advice and gone, that is fantastic, I'm going to do it, <laughs> right? Like, obviously you were already in the mood. <laughs> You already wanted to hear wisdom from someone else. And you already saw that there was some sort of suffering within you that could use some more information to navigate through, right? If someone gave you the best advice on earth, but you weren't open to it, it's not gonna land. Or if it's so far out of reach and it feels overwhelming, you'll say, that's amazing and great, but I could never do that. So you have to be like 90% there, don't you? And then someone can help you with that last 10% when you're open to it. But the, the precision of the advice, the accuracy of the advice, the kindness of the communication, the tone, all of those are conditions. You could have all of those perfectly done, tick all the boxes of your, I don't know, your nonviolent communication, your excellent mediation work, you know, your acknowledgement of this and that, and your intersectionalism and like really good tone and like smiley face, all the things. And someone could probably still say, not nah, if they're not open, <laughs> right? The Buddha could be in front of us explaining it precisely and we'd go, not nah, if we're not open. So like take the pressure off of yourself because if someone's receptive, you can even say something clunky and inelegant and not with the right words and not with the right flow and losing all your eloquence. And they'll be like, I hear the wisdom in that and they can take it on board. If you're in the mood to hear wisdom, you can hear it anywhere. You could pick a book out of the library, open it at random, read a sentence and go, that is just what I needed today. Because you were in the mood to hear wisdom. You are ready for health. Yeah. So this giving of Dharma, again, is this mental attitude of, one, you have wisdom that can be offered. You know, so it's some confidence. But two, it's only useful when they're open. So I'll just keep it as my lovely treasure. And if anyone wants it, I'm happy to share. But if they don't, it's fine. Yeah, I'll just live it. I'll try and embody it. I'll model it. Some people will notice if they're in the mood to notice. Yeah. And if they're not, they're going to project all sorts of things onto me that aren't true and be like, hmm, Buddhists are blah, 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 blah. And they'll have all sorts of stories. And there's no preventing that. Yeah. So, you know, this can be a real good exercise in not caring about reputation. Yeah, because you ha could have something beautiful to offer and state it perfectly 
and people throw it right back in your face and say, I didn't want that. How dare you tell me that? That's too confronting. That's too soon. That's too whatever. So timely advice when asked is the most profound form of generosity. The others are incredibly excellent, but this is the hardest one, the most profound one. Yeah. And then we'll do these other two. So this one I think is really beautiful and really um, applicable in community, in families, in workplaces, which is giving refuge or safety. So Geshele says, if the life of any being is in danger, we have to help in any way we can. The practice of giving refuge results in very good fruit immediately and deeply. The essence of this is giving freedom from fear. Yeah. So if you were to ask yourself, what are people afraid of the most in their daily life? What would you say? Yeah, if you want to offer this kind of generosity, this refuge, this freedom from fear, the question is, what are people afraid of? What are you afraid of? What is anxiety? You know, what is the anxiety rumble in your daily life? What's the worry? Yeah, Christina. I would say as far as your question goes about um, most people's biggest fear is being like not being rejected or like unloved, right? Yep. Yep, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, the most fancy, sophisticated person who seems to have their act together still just wants to be loved and accepted. Yeah. The, um, the snottiest teenager who locks themselves in their room and, you know, leaves all rooms with slamming the door and tossing the hair just wants to be loved, <laughs> right? Like, you know, the jerk that cuts you off in, cra in traffic, the, you know, the person who is rude to you at the supermarket, all these, they just want to be loved and accepted. Yeah. And if you kind of lose hope that it's possible, you become brittle and defensive and grumpy and pretend like you don't need it, you know, but it's still there. <laughs> so offering freedom from fear and offering loving kindness go together really beautifully. But I think one big piece is asking ourselves, how can I make people safe with me? How can I make people feel safe with me? How can I be a safe space personally and individually? Is there anything in how I am or how I communicate that would make people feel unsafe? You know, it could be logistical things like consistency or clarity or I don't know honesty things to look at it could be things that are intimidating it could be things that are I don't know oppressive there's a million ways that we might create an unsafe environment for people while still being kind of conventionally ethical yeah conventionally ethical so it's it's an inner reflection I can hear you. you can hear me it's an inner reflection because um, it's not like we want to be tiptoeing around on eggshells with people trying not to hurt their feelings. It's not about that. It's having that deep conviction and confidence that we can be bigger than people's afflictions. We can be bigger than their neuroses. We can hold the space for people to be, I don't know, any kind of way to be foolish, to be unkind. We're not going to hold a grudge. We're not going to criticize. We're not going to remind people of the faults they made last week unless it's important to do so. We're going to create safety. Imagine if we all kind of let each other off the hook a little bit, you know, gave people the benefit of the doubt, just kind of like let people make mistakes and like let them feel safe to confess mistakes. I mean, can you imagine how different things would have gone during the big first wave of the Me Too stuff if the men who were confronted felt safe to say, yes, I did that, I am sorry, I won't now. What if they just said that, right? right? Rather than being defensive, rather than denying it, rather than all the things, what if they just said, you're right, I did do that. That was unacceptable. Here's what I'm gonna do moving forward. What can I do to repair it? Like, imagine if it was just like a conversation. Yeah, we can try and create atmospheres where these things can be discussed. But if people feel like 
by admitting or confessing or revealing faults, they are going to be cut out of the herd, why would they ever be honest? Yeah, why would they be honest if they're just going to be discarded? So this is, again, it's not letting people off the hook, but it's kind of this inner conversation of, would people feel safe telling me their darkest secrets and know that I would still hold them with loving kindness and compassion and accountability? Is that the atmosphere I'm creating internally? Is that the atmosphere I bring externally? It's kind of an interesting thing to sit with. What do you think? Qualms? Questions? Eve, yeah. Yeah, just to tie that into where we started about the snotty teenagers, this is a good uh, solution for the snotty teenagers to give them a space where they can say what they need to say. And um, sometimes you don't get that skill till you're the grandmother. So yeah. <laughs> all you parents who just, just wait a generation. <laughs> it's good news. <laughs> yeah. It's good news. Yeah. Look, and you know, here, here that I'm not letting people off the hook for bad behavior, but I'm letting them, I'm letting them stay in the community. Because if we're just kicking out everyone who misbehaves, eventually we'll have no one left. You know, there are some cases where someone needs to be asked to leave. There are. Absolutely. And there also needs to be some sort of space for people to repair, you know, and acknowledge. And, and I think this offering freedom from fear conversation is 100% goes without saying, make sure people who are harmed are safe to recover, prevent people from being harmed, but also looking at the harmers and asking how can we bring them back into the fold and help them change their hearts so they won't do such things over and over again? How can we change the cultures of places where someone who was once toxic is no longer toxic? You know, why is it that AA is so useful? Part of it is that the sponsors are people who are recovering. You know, they know what it is to have fallen on their faces. So they're in a much better position to help other people. Yeah. So this is just something to sit with, see how it lands in your own life. And then the last form of generosity is love itself. And this is sometimes confusing for, for Buddhists because you might be a Buddhist a long time and then you eventually read about things like uh, minds and mental factors and you don't see love explicitly on the list. And strangely, it's because it lives here in the perfection of generosity. That's where the word love lives. It's a type of generosity. So from a Buddhist perspective, love is the practice or the uh, active love is the wish to give real happiness to all beings. So again, the key words here are wish or intention. It's not the success of that. It's not the behaviors of that. It's the intention. And then the things that flow from it are going to have the best chance of, you know, whatever success. But that's not the immediate thing. It's not about fixing. So just by having this wish, we cannot directly help beings straight away, but if it is cultivated, it will eventually have great results. So that's, that's the other piece to sit with is that we can be the most loving person on earth. That doesn't mean people feel it. We can, we've been surrounded ourselves with love. It doesn't mean we've felt it. The Buddhas are loving us constantly and do we always access it? You know, so just the fact that there is love doesn't mean that it's felt. But if we ourselves are loving, the first recipient is your own heart. You know, you're full of love. It's kind of radiating through your body. You're a lot more at ease. You're feeling fullness and you're feeling connection. Then from that place, the people that are open will feel that. And the people who aren't won't. And that's poignant, but it's not a deficiency on your side. So just have a little sit with that, you know, as you stretch and grab a cuppa and uh, we'll come back in five minutes.
Okay, come on back, everybody. All right, so we'll do our meditation. Um, and then if there are hanging questions or hanging insights, you can uh, flesh those out. So just take a minute and get yourself into a good posture for meditation, somehow a straight back. Um, if you're having back problems and it's really hurting, it's okay to lie down flat on the floor, but the important thing is to try and get your spine as straight as it can be without tilt, because that'll help you stay focused. And if you're in a chair, trying not to rely too much on the chair. If you need to add cushions or subtract cushions. And as you settle into your posture, just do a brief scan from the crown of your head all the way down to the tip of your toes, releasing and relaxing any tension you might find. And then revive your motivation. Thinking I do this meditation in order to deepen my understanding and my practice of all six perfections, particularly generosity. And I do this in order to access and develop into my fullest potential so that I can be of greatest benefit to all. And then identify in your mind, what is generosity, this intention to give, this perfection motivated by bodhicitta, whether it's giving property, dharma, refuge, or love. Think, are there examples in my life of this kind of heightened generosity? Whether a mentor or a historical figure, religious leader or whatever, just think what is my own example of someone who embodies this generosity? Someone who you can tell is ready to give whatever is needed without pressure or expectations. And then using your memory, try and think of a time when you yourself were as close to that as you're able to be so far in your practice. What's an example of you with burgeoning perfection of generosity? What are you like?
And then as an exercise for self-knowledge, without any guilt or shame, also use your memory to think, when have I been generous, but loaded with expectations and attachment, full of pressure on myself or the recipient? What is my own mistaken form of generosity? Just see if you can identify that within yourself. Without guilt or shame, just knowledge. And the next time I feel that version of mistaken generosity arise, what's one or two things I could remind myself in order to adjust back to the cleaner form, the bodhicitta form? What words would help me recalibrate? And moving forward, what's something I could do for my practice of generosity, of charity, or giving material things? Something that won't trigger a sense of deprivation, that wouldn't escalate my pride? What is one simple form of giving that I could build into my life as it is right now? whether it's a small offering on the altar, whether it's a bird feeder outside, money to a Dharma center or charity, a way of looking after a relative or a friend, just think of something practical that would work in your own life. small enough to keep going. And what's one way I could begin to offer more freedom from fear or refuge to sentient beings? What compassionate presence could I cultivate to be a condition for people to feel at ease?
even if it's just one individual that you could be a little bit more gentle with. And the generosity of love is something that is ongoing in our life already, but we might need to clarify for ourselves the difference between love and attachment. Love is wanting others to have happiness. Attachment may want them to have happiness, but so that they give us happiness. And we may be ready to give advice or share Dharma, but what is the way in which to do it that is useful for those who want it as to opposed to when we feel like we should do it or are imposing it or not reading the room correctly when there's no space for it. and think through the energy of these thoughts. May we develop all six perfections. May we become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. And we deepen that by adding the compassion wisdom mantra. Om Om Mani Padme Hum. 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 And imagine that the mantra, the essence of its meaning, continues to reverberate within you and radiates out. And you can relax your attention. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, and if you need to go, um, go ahead and go, no problem. Um, if there's some announcements from Christina, um, we could do those now. Wonderful. Yeah, I just want to let you all know, thank you for being here, each and one of every one of you. And of course, to Venerable Yunton for a beautiful teaching. Thank you. And you continue to teach. Um, I have a couple of announcements. Next Sunday, Venerable Yunton will be, and I'm going to go ahead and put it in here in the chat so that you guys have the link to um, register. Um, next Sunday, September 19th, um, Venerable Yunten will be having a class called Experience Meditation. There'll be two sessions of meditation. Um, there'll be one in the morning and then there'll be a short break. 
or a bit of a longer break, I should say, not a short break, and then another session in the afternoon. So go ahead and check that out. We also have on Saturday, September 25th, a death and rebirth day long retreat that will be led by Venerable Amy. Um, and that's uh, Saturday, uh, September 25th. Um, also, what I'm going to do very quickly, our next class, uh, the six um, perfections will be next Wednesday. I know some of you have um, actually gone ahead and just registered for the whole class. So that's that's wonderful. Thank you for your for your donations. All of your donations go to um, you know support the workings of, of Land of Medicine Buddha and keep our doors open. Um, and so here I went ahead and put in the chat the um, link to register for next week's class for those of you who are registering for each class weekly to make it very easy for you just click on it right now it will take you to the registration page so you can get ready set for next next week thank you so much and if you have any questions feel free to email me at spc at, um, at medicinebuddha.org not land of medicine buddha medicinebuddha.org have a beautiful evening everyone thank you Thank you, Christina. And um, if we if there's hanging um, questions, write them down. Yeah, bring them to next class. Um, is there anything pressing before we call it a night? I don't want to if someone's got a burning one. Um, I just had a practical one about sure. about the study book, if that's available someplace to download. Did, did I miss something with that? Um, yeah, the link is in the chat, um, but I can um, pop it back in there right this second in case you uh, missed it. So I'll put it, it'll be in the chat. It'll be um, with a little Adobe icon Great. and you just click it and download it. And that is uploading right this second. It's called Wednesday class handout. So that's Great. that. And um, Thank you. I'll see everybody next week. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. In the chat. Thank you. See you next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Australia. Thanks, New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks down the hall. <laughs> and is the uh, will the next two weeks also be available on YouTube? I'm doing a 10 day silent Vipassana retreat, so I'll miss the next two Wednesdays, but um, those will be in uh, download for YouTube. Um, they'll just be up on my personal YouTube, Van Yuntin. Um, oh, okay. Yep. Excellent. So last week's already up and I'll, I'll get this one up in the next few days. So usually, you know, maybe three or four days after it airs, it'll appear on, um, on my YouTube channel. And it's just the playlist that says six perfections. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Venerable. Yontan, yeah. how do you, how do you access things in the chat when you're not on zoom? You can't. Oh. You can't, you got to download it um, onto your tablet or onto your computer and then it will live there forever. How do you do that? How do I do um, that? Um, if well, you, you actually, like oh yeah, me, I, I emailed you um, and even Kitty, I know you registered pretty late. You registered right before class. So I, I actually sent you an email um, already with it in your email as well. But Eleanor, what we can do is I'm going to send you my email in the chat right now so that you have my email and um, myself or Kat, who is my um, admin, she, we can help you walk you through it. Um, she's okay. actually quite good at that sort of thing. So I'm gonna write it to you right now. It's SPC and I'm gonna write it to you in the chat, SPC at medicinebuddha.org and we can help you out with that. Dot org, just medicinebuddha.org. Yep, S SPC at medicinebuddha.org, yes. Thank you, thank you. Lovely. No worries. Lovely to see you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks so Good much. Morning. Afternoon. <laughs> yeah, afternoon for you.